right. Uh, welcome everyone to uh, to this podcast, video podcast. We're calling it Toe to Toe. Um, the goal is to bring together experts in the field who may or may not agree on everything, but certainly agree on the on the fundamental things. Um, I'm my name is Hodges Davis. I'll be the moderator here. Um, my two um, toe to toe experts are uh, Justin Kane and Mike Arenari, and uh, they actually were residents together, been out and practiced for uh, seven plus years uh, after their foot and ankle fellowship. And uh, today we're gonna talk about complications of neuropathic problems in the foot. So we'll talk about charco, we'll talk about fractures. And the, the goal of this is to say, um, it's time to bring the treatment of this difficult patient population um, into this millennium. Um, we have so much better options, uh, both surgical and non-surgical, to treat these folks. And so our goal is to have fun with it, but more than anything is to bring the, the realization that we've got to up our game. Um, comments on that, Mike? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when Justin and I trained, uh, these patients were casted and the, you know, rule of thumb was you don't ever operate on acute charco or hot charco, uh, even in through fellowship. And um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a patient come in who uh, was treated with the quote unquote standard of care. But we all know there really isn't one for charco. And uh, you're starting out their treatment with a complication and we'll get into cases later. But you know, you, even something as benign as a cast can be catastrophic, and, and you quickly will find yourself with these patients uh, uh, down the creek, so to speak. And I think, um, you know, we've talked about this before, paradigm is shifting, and, and, you know, we'll go into a little basic science here and some stuff that we're doing at Penn State in our lab just confirms everything I think we, we here at the table know, and it's that, uh, you know, earlier intervention uh, and protection of these patients is paramount. So Mike's coming to us from an academic um, standpoint. Justin, you're, you've been in private practice since day one, kind of on the front lines, mm -hmm. in more ways than not, those of us who know you. Um, what is your feeling about uh, if you wait, or is, is casting really a benign or sometimes the worst thing to do? I, I think we, um, to echo the sentiment that's already been said, um, you know, the dog is not always correct irrespective of what we talk about in medicine. And I think sometimes if you wait, you're too late. Because if you start with an ulcer, you start with a wound, we know the, the, the literature, we know you have a 25% risk if you have an ulcer and a diabetic that they are gonna become an amputee. So this whole paradigm that we're talking about of shifting from waiting and letting Charcot convalesce into something that is deformed, put you in that position where you are much more likely to get an ulcer. And we know that these patients don't necessarily have great access to great care wherever they are. So if you can intervene early and have an outcome that prevents them from getting an ulcer, you do change their life. You do save their life in, in many instances. So I found myself from residency, you know, we trained together and Mike said it, but even fellowship, the, the, the dogma was you sit on Charcot. You sit on Charcot unless you can't. But I think by that point, the cat's out of the bag. If, if, if you're saying, well, now it's time to go in, now you're doing something heroic, trying to salvage something that may not be salvageable. Whereas if we had treated it early, maybe it's easier, especially with the tools in our, in our, in our bag that we have now that are much different than when all of this came out 30, 40, 50 years ago. We have the options, we, we have the tools, we have the understanding that we can better intervene early. And these people who have spent eight months, 12 months, two years offloading, losing their jobs, getting divorced, losing their family, and to ultimately lose their limb, you put them in a position to succeed, you put them in a position to be happier and have a better outcome and be a productive member of society. And, and why do we care? I mean, I have general surgery colleagues who will walk in the pre-op and they'll see a patient with a, a diabetic ulcer in his midfoot and you go, well, I have the treatment for that. I'll just do a BK amputation. Why not? Well, because we know that within three years, a third of those patients are going to get the other one cut off. We know within five years, up to 50% of them won't be around anymore. 
And we've all seen it. We've all had the patients where we've tried, we've tried, and then we've cut their leg off. And, you know, I give my patients my cell phone to this day, and I'll get a call from their family member that, you know, so-and-so is not coming into the office because they passed away. And I think the time is now, we have to address this now to change what people think so we don't get those calls anymore. So we don't have to think, well, I wonder why Mr. Jones didn't come to my clinic. Did he die? And that's that's a thought I have routinely on my Charco patients when they don't show up. And Mike, I mean, you're, I know you all are doing some ongoing prospective stuff as well as some lab stuff when it, in regards to these patients. Are you seeing that? I mean, I, I had someone tell me, oh, we're treating diabetes so much better now, so we don't have as many problems with diabetics, diabetic foot problems as well as Charco. Are you seeing that in the university setting? Yeah, so um, the, you know, despite modern advances and uh, a full complement of a tertiary care center, we just pulled 1,900 Charco patients uh, in a big database and our mortality rate was about 10% better in those that had an amputation. And that's with an infectious disease specialist, a limb salvage Charco specialist, uh, full complement of care, endocrinologists are seeing our patients because we have the resources. And, and we've only improved or, or decreased mortality 10%. And, and that's, it's, it's just not enough. And so I think, like Justin said earlier, if, if we can salvage these limbs, I, I think we'll see a, a directional change. And, and hopefully, uh, with research supporting us, uh, can shift the paradigm to, uh, you know, earlier intervention, earlier salvage, uh, and I think part, part of what we'll probably be debating today is what's the best way to go about that. And I think that's where there's no clear consensus. And I know we're all working on guidelines for the academy and for the society. Um, and hopefully over the next few years, we kind of continue to push the envelope and, and use evidence to get there. Well, and I love working with the, you young guys who have a passion for this. The final thing before we start into the more formal part of this is everything being equal, right? Um, these, these are patients that need our help and need our care. In some places that are not in major centers, um, the care is coming from the general surgeons because they take care of the ulcers and immediately think that those are dysvascular ulcers and that's who they take care of. Um, are you finding that people who come from, from the rural areas are not getting the same level of care? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, with our data pool, we actually are going to show this uh, and submitted it for a recent abstract that those in outside of the network of the tertiary care actually had a higher mortality rate than those counties surrounding our hospital system. So to your point, um, if you don't have a, a, a you know, specialist, uh, someone who's owning the bone or owning the ulcers, uh, kind of you know, managing the shark code like we all do, you do see an increase in mortality and and um, and access to care. Uh, socioeconomics do play a part in that too. We found uh, in in um, the most recent project we did. So, yeah, I think access for patients with shark code to a center that's capable of of uh, whether it's one guy <laughs> or a group of five. Um, uh, as long as you have an expert who's ready to take on these difficult cases. Uh, you're going to see improved results. All right. The final question: You're you're on the front lines, right? You're taking call. You you are the senior partner in a group that is taking call. You're working in multiple hospitals. Um, can you get away from neuropathy? Can you just say, "I'm not going to treat neuropathy," or is it going to find you? It's going to find you, and whether whether you think you see it or not, it has seen you. Um, and I think that. As a group, we have to do a better job of educating our colleagues, whether that's the ER that you're taking call at or the infectious disease doctor who you share patients with or the vascular doctor that you share patients with. These are out there. These are coming to your clinic. And if you're going to take the, uh, the attitude that you're just going to put the bag over your head and go the other direction, you're going to wind up missing these patients and you're going to get called at the ER at 3 o'clock in the morning with somebody who's septic and you're going to be cutting them off. You're going to be cutting their legs off rather than doing what we should be doing, which is fixing them. And it's not all diabetics. It's no. it's rheumatoids. It's alcoholics. And alcoholics. Yeah. I mean, we have we certainly have the lifestyle here to support continued and uh, and a varied presentation of neuropathy. All right. So the way we're going to set this up, and I want it to be informal and fun, but I also 
wanted to uh, to have some basis to it. So, Mike, I'm going to have you as the professor here. Um, now, just calling you that doesn't mean you can send me a, a letter say, asking me to support um, your full professorship, but uh, but we're going to have you start. Um, and when you get to cases, we're going to have Justin comment on that, like he has your entire career, really. He's been your uh, your best sounding board, and he's the only one that's that's called you an idiot more than than uh, your attendance. <laughs> more so, than a criminal. Yeah, <laughs> criminal. <laughs> All right. So uh, so why don't we start? Um, you've got a you've got a presentation, and when we start with the cases, then we can uh, we can do that at the end. Um, after Justin presents his, I have some lightning round questions that I think will illustrate finally kind of the things that I've learned after, you know, 31 years of, of chasing this. So, all right, Mike. Thanks, Otis. Um Here's our disclaimer slide. So um, I think uh, everyone uh, in this room knows this well, but this is a progressive uh, denervation induced destruction of joints. Uh, osteoclasts are basically chewing up bone. Uh, so our, our nerves are signaling our normal bone cells to do really have normal things. This is a picture from one of our patients uh, in one of our studies. Uh, you can see here, this is histopathology. You can see all these osteoclasts and that's bone and cartilage embedded in synovium. And that's, that's kind of diagnostic on histopathology for Charcot. And here we are, 2023, this is non-curable and irreversible. And I think, um, you know, we kind of hit on this earlier, but this is an incredibly huge problem. You know, our grant we submitted to the NIH, the, the foundation of what, what's the problem at hand is, is staggering. You know, 10% of all diabetics are neuropathic. So you start extrapolating math, that's millions and millions of people in America alone. Uh, 25% of patients with Charcot will develop an ulcerative infection over a period of time. <clears throat> and in the United States, this is billions of dollars annually in the U.S. And as Justin uh, kind of highlighted, uh, our five-year mortality is 44% in these patients when they have a major amputation. Um, I, I don't want to belabor this or turn this into a basic science lecture, but but the best way to think of this is if you combine neuropathy and trauma, you have abnormal nerve cells releasing neuropeptides, then stimulating the vascular system. You get a huge uptick in inflammation and then osteoclasts ramp up and they start just chewing away bone. And this is that quote unquote hot phase of Charcot, which we, we were told never ever operate on someone. They should cast, you should take their temperatures, wait till they collapse and, and form this kind of rocker dislocation you can see in the bottom picture here, and then it's safe to operate. But as you see here in this, in this clinical slide, this patient has an ulcer and now they're infected, and, and you're starting from the bottom of the hill working up at this point. And to get really deep um, into this, and this is where some of our work's ongoing right now, uh, th there's this huge pro-inflammatory cytokine response um, that's, that's triggered a, a, kind of this big, you're almost like circling the toilet drain here with there's trauma, they can't feel they're walking on it because of the neuropathy, the nerves send more signals, osteoclasts ramp up harder, more pro-inflammatory cytokines get going and the osteoclasts just, just chew and melt away the bone. And I know we all have x-rays here where it's you know, home run reduction, you're high-fiving everyone, you leave the OR, and, and you know, in three months, the, the talus is gone. And, and um, so if we can somehow break inflammation and, and break this. I don't know if we'll ever be able to reverse the changes of the nerve, but if we can somehow stop this cycle, we, we might be able to get a leg up. And um, I think, um, you know, we, we just talked about this in, in a debate, but I mean, um, on the AFS uh, symposium, but the mortality rate after Henkel fractures in Charcot patients is one in five. That's, that's astronomical. Uh, amputation rates between six and twenty percent. Infection rates forty percent. I mean, these are people that can get really bad complications really quick if if you're not familiar with Charcot or if you un you know they're unrecognized neuropathy. And and we'll get into that in cases uh, in a little bit. I don't want to go through these articles in too much detail, but but I think it's the, these are real numbers and real statistics. And, you know, amputations associated with Charcot over the last 30, 40 years is just skyrocketing. And I think this so is not going down. Not going, going down. down. It yeah. is going up. And, 
you know, th this slide I think is the most powerful slide uh, I have, and I show it to people at research meetings and stuff, and it's it's still mind blowing to me. Uh, but the data is real. Charco without amputation it, it is worse in quality life adjusted years than breast cancer. And if you have a major amputation, you're one step behind lung cancer, and you're above leukemia, which, which is is very hard to believe. But it, but if you go back to the data, like Justin said, five years. If you have an amputation, almost half those people are gone. And so we, we got to do something. And, I mean, that's even significant <clears throat> in Texas. And so, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, and, and this is this is still classic teaching. And, and I think there, there is a role for immobilization and offloading. And, and, and it can't be understated that you need to protect these patients with plastic in their shoes, prevent ulcer, skin breakdown, because they have neuropathy. They cannot feel. Even with it well-corrected, deformity. Um, but, but there are complication rates that are very high with casting. And, and I think one of the important things that hopefully will come out the next few years is, and, and I know you, at Ortho Carolina, you guys have done some nice work in just predicting who's not going to do well with non-operative treatment um, and, and knowing when to recognize that on clinical exam and with x-rays and, and when it's time to operate and shift gears. Just to show you the complications, I just presented this case uh, just this week on our call, but here's a ankle fracture, was treated casted in outside hospital, shows up for their four week skin check and, and they get films and here's their skin. And, and the outside surgeon tried to plate it, they did their best and he offered him amputation. The patient's family called to our facility, uh, seeing if there's anything to be done. Fortunately, I was on call uh, and uh, one of my trauma partners accepted it for me. And, and we were able, able to save her leg, and we'll, I think we'll get into this case later, but, but this is how quickly things can go south. That's four weeks of conservative treatment in, in a high-risk patient. doesn't seem irrational uh, when you kind of lay it out like that, but th these can go south very quickly. Um, I think when we, when we talk about treatment in the setting of infection, and Justin and I can debate this hard uh, here, there's, you know, amputation. This was the classic treatment, uh, you know, years ago, and we just showed why this is not an appropriate treatment with some exceptions, uh, sepsis, necrotizing fasciitis, okay, maybe below the amputation is appropriate for that patient for life-saving matters. But in general, we want to be the patient up top. We're, we're getting the ulcer closed. We're clearing the infection, eventually getting them into um, uh, a, a brace. Uh, and, and so, you know, I think uh, Lou, uh, uh, my mentor and fellowship always said, we want to get these feet stable, infection free and plantar great. And you at a course took it one step further and it really struck a chord with me is that foot needs to fit in a shoe or brace. Uh, and, and, you know, and early on in practice, I was just trying to get them to a crow or, or, or a cast, save their leg, get rid of the infection. And, and they seemed happy and I was happy, but, but I realized as the years went by that, that the real goal here is to get them into a braceable foot. That then you know you've done a nice job. And look, this this is high stakes uh, uh, poker here. We are we are playing with very high complication rates, and you need to be ready to deal with some of these complications, which I'm I'm sure we're going to get into here in cases. Uh, but um, it's not for the faint of heart. And um, uh, not not to get too professorial, but but I've learned a lot from the mice we've we've been running the last five years. And uh, so it, this, this is. Not rocket science, uh, but I, I said to one of my mentors, John Elfar, hand guy, I said, hey, what do you think if we took a uh, di diet-induced obese mouse that's known to be neuropathic and we just ran it and ran it and ran it, what would happen? Do you think we could create a, a, a Charcot-like model? And he said, hey, sounds good. I'll give you some seed money and internal grant, and we purchased this treadmill. I want halfsies with him. And lo and behold, uh, after running these mice for a period of about eight weeks, we started to see mid tarsal and is the hind paws. So the treadmill's at an incline so that the four paws wouldn't be affected, but the hind paws were on the left hand side on these images, you can see pretty normal tarsal joints. And on the right hand side, there's subluxation there at the TMT on that top image. And, and you can see this collapse and, and that, that very similar calcaneous uh, pitch we see with, with a real unstable Charcot. And we said that that's great, and and this was significant when we compared uh, our dye-induced obese mice to our controls running and non. And here's a real good look at those subluxation measurements uh, on um, uh, micro CT and plain X-rays for the for the mice. And then we went one step further and did H and E, and all of a sudden, 
on the far image there, that's a very normal uh, joint uh, from, from the uh, essentially talonavicular equivalent in a mouse. And on the left-hand slide where those arrows are, you can see pre-fragmentation um, at that area. And so we've kind of taken this uh, and we're now uh, doing a bunch of stains with some colleagues up uh, at University Park uh, to look at inflammatory markers and some things that people have done a little bit of work with, but uh, we want to get to the point where we can intervene and, and stop progression before they start to fragment and collapse. Because it's, as you, as you both know, it's, we usually see them once they dislocate it or once they become. Now, Justin, when you, when you were on call with Mike in residency, I mean, at any point did you look at him and say, you're going to know Mike, mice anatomy, and that's really going to not be what I'm going to know? I mean, it's a Actually, it's very funny. I, I think if you went 10 years back with the two of us, we would be in the opposite seat tier. So I always wanted to do academics, and I always thought Mike was going to join a uh, private practice. And lo and behold, here we are, and um, I feel very stupid sitting next to Mike. At least I'm a better surgeon, though. <laughs> and he, t he told me that you always felt that way. So this is true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that this is such groundbreaking research. I really do, because ultimately, you know, once you have the model, then you can talk about treatment, right? Yeah. Can can you can you at least stop it by some more aggressive immobilization? I think it's awesome. And um, I think I've I've seen it three times. It's the first time I've understood it. So that's also important for me. Yeah. The the, the quick one liner from all of this uh, fr from our preliminary work for the model is that just being morbidly obese with neuropathy and having a high A one C does not produce Charcot, and just running and giving a normal mouse a ton of trauma does not produce the same collapse. It, it really is this combination of trauma and neuropathy, as we've always believed. Uh, it's just now a matter of when is it best to intervene? When can we break the cycle? Um, and if we took trauma out of the equation, which we did on our subsequent studies after the preliminary one, they didn't develop Charcot. And so I think... Uh, you know, you want to ex extrapolate that one step further, and this this is a study we're currently doing. Is early intervention, early stabilization works. Uh, obviously, putting a, a, a thin wire fixer on a, a mouse is very difficult to do. So we're, we're taking the uh, uh, biologic uh, role. Uh, there's some proteins and things with uh, uh, anti-pro-inflammatory mediators, uh, which. Uh, one of my colleagues at State College is an expert in, and, and they've done some work with lung inflammation. He wants to give our Charcot mice those early to see if it blunts a response, um, something that might be an adjuvant to our surgery. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and so we're, we're obviously working our way through the dark here, but we're on to something. Uh, and and kind of like we've all known at heart, if we, if we can stop the cycle and stop the spin, we have a chance. And so Don't, that's one I'd have to take his word for putting an external fixer on a mice. With <laughs> Justin might I'll, be able to do yeah, it. Yeah, I know. Don't that's what I think. Get his loops on and he might I mean, be there. <laughs> if, uh, he would do it in the middle of the night and his wife would call us and blame us. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> so I think uh, before everyone falls asleep watching this, um, I, I want to strike home the final note, which this is was a sweet Amish woman who has knitted me and my children many, many blankets since. She came in with swollen foot for a few weeks, and then she saw a PA, and the PA brought me down to the clinic, and obviously her, her talus is squirted out, and we went right to the OR that evening, got a reduced frame on, and I did, I did hybrid uh, construct for her, because um, when we got in there, it didn't, didn't seem overly infected, and uh, we were able to, to salvage her leg, and uh, she still sends Christmas cards. So I think, um, you know, could, could we have avoided the frame, if she might have seen her earlier, perhaps, and we'll, I think we'll get into that here in the And that really seconds. is the question. Is, is there something you can do between disaster and otherwise that would be in between? And so I think these are the hot topics. I agree. Why don't you go through them and then we can, because these are the conversations that we need to have on almost every patient, yep. almost every patient. Yeah, I agree. And I think you know, the, the first is, you know, when to frame and when not to frame. And, and I, I know there's a lot of people who are seeing a lot of Charcot and, and maybe they don't feel comfortable with the frame. And 
I've put frames on patients when I probably could have gotten away with just internal fixation. And, and there really is no standard of care uh, on, on when to put a frame on. But they are powerful and they are necessary when you're treating uh, a lot of these patients. Uh, medical optimization. So, um, you know, obviously uh, we, we could try to make them as healthy as possible. And I mean, we have endocrinologists following our patients. You know, they have glucometers and all these new mod fancy monitoring systems. Hasn't changed mortality in, in, in our groups, what, whether you're, you're getting reconstruction, salvage, or an amputation. Um, but but uh, so I, I put up here, is this even possible? Uh, I mean, I, I think we can. So I, I look at this a little differently. I mean, are you going to medically optimize a patient who has an unstable ankle fracture? No. Are you going to medically optimize a Liz Frank fracture dislocation that's traumatic? I mean, there's a time and a place for medical optimization. And I think this has to be looked at almost on a case-by-case -case basis. Can you get away with medically optimizing this patient? Or if you wait, do you get to that point where now you have a disaster on your hands? And that's, that's the benefit of the frame, right? You don't have to put the hardware in. And even if you're going to stabilize it with the frame to keep it where it is to stop it from falling apart, you're not making an incision. You have a lower likelihood of, of risk. And then you, you at a tertiary care facility, you know, I don't have the tools that you have, but you have a team there that can help optimize them. And then you can go in and, and, and get your home run down the road. Totally agree. I, I think that's the that's the key. And and we know that A1C is sometimes three months delayed. Are you gonna wait three months? Because in three months you're gonna end up you can end up with a whole different surgical strategy that and we'll show those cases that, that yep. doesn't bode well for the patient. Yep. Um and then, you know, I think uh I early on, uh, tried to do everything in one shot. And I know Justin is a firm believer in one stage for most patients. Um, and then we, we looked at uh, a series where uh, if they ever had an ulcer, the osteomyelitis uh, or positive bone cultures from the time we sent samples was like 40%. So I backpedaled, backpedaled and said, oh man, I got to start breaking these up and staging them because, you know, I've, I've been probably putting hardware in patients who had, you know, subtle, stable infections with a staph or, you know, some something that's um, not making them sick, sick, but they're colonized. Uh, and so I think we need to get into that when we discuss. And then, um, you know, I, th I think static frames are, are what we need to be putting on most of these patients, but there is a role for dynamic framing, I think, in Charcot. And um, I think, uh, you know, folks that say won't be on it, but, but I definitely have been utilizing a burr, uh, to help with debridements and exostectomies, um, even osteotomies. Um, and, um, I think some of the future in our treatment will involve that. And then last thing maybe we can wrap up with is some soft tissue coverage discussion. Uh, not my forte. Our plastic surgeons usually walk in the room and say, you got this, Mike. Great. Good luck. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, my workhorse for this has just been, you know, uh, rotational closures with the hurricane incision or just use, utilizing shortening uh, uh, to get coverage, sometimes with the help of a split thickness graft from a plastic surgeon, but it's it's rare that they'll do a free flap on any patient. Yeah, shortening will solve a lot of soft tissue ills, that is for sure. Um, okay, well, do you want to show a few cases and then we'll, uh, we'll come back, uh, we'll let Justin comment on that even before he sees what you've done and and um, y'all can renew that that uh, confrontational friendship. <laughs> <laughs>